Hi, library friends. We are here for a big kid story time. And I've got some interesting books today. I've got some library books, but I also have some books from my own library that I used to read to my kids when they were little. So we'll call this classics, I guess. The first one, I'm gonna flip around so you can see the pictures. The first one is called Amos, the story of an old dog and his couch by Susan Seligson and Howie Schneider. And it's uh, Little Brown and Company is the publisher. My kids used to love this story. Amos is an old dog who lives on an old couch in an old house. That used to be filled with activity. Once the kids were all grown up and had moved away, things were kind of quiet. Mr. and Mrs. Bobson went out a lot, but they never took Amos with them anymore. Where do they go, Amos wondered. If only I could go along, he thought. One day, after the Bobsons had gone out, Amos awakened, was awakened by a loud, persistent bzzz. He hadn't caught a fly in years, but he decided to give it a try. Snap, 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 snap. He tried and tried. Finally, he went after it with his paw. Slam! He missed the fly, but had hit something else, for suddenly... Vroom! The couch moved! Amos hit the cushion again. The couch seemed to come alive. Vroom, vroom! He tried it again and again. Crash! Finally, he backed the couch up very slowly and guided it into place. Amos could not remember when he had been so tired or so happy. Here he is on the bottom, that smile. A couch that moves. The next morning, Amos could hardly wait for the Bobsons to leave. As soon as they were gone, he started up his couch and threw it into gear. Vroom! He shot out the door just in time to spot the Bobsons pulling out of the driveway. So he followed them. Right out into traffic. He managed to stay with them all the way to the supermarket. Probably gonna buy me some chicken, he thought. But he waited patiently for their return. Look, he drives his couch right into the parking lot. It's a pretty good driver for a dog. He didn't mind waiting. He had plenty of company. Look at all the other dogs in the cars. Pretty soon, the Bobsons were back. Amos started up his couch and followed the Bobsons out of the parking lot. Next, they stopped at a yard sale. Amos had to think fast. Say, that looks like our couch, said Mr. Bobson. Oh, it couldn't be, said Mrs. Bobson. Our couch is home with Amos on. Amos hiding behind the couch. He had to think fast. Amos decided he had taken enough chances for one day. When the Bobsons drove off on their next errand, he headed straight for home. When the Bobsons got back, they found Amos stretched out on his couch as usual, looking a bit more tired than usual. That night, they all had chicken, just as Amos knew they would. The next morning, Amos wasted no time. As soon as he heard the Bobsons start their motor, he started his. Vroom! And he was on his way. Whoosh! Right out the door with the couch. He followed them downtown. See the couch? All the other cars are off the road. And over the bridge. Through the zoo. Past the playground, Amos began to grow tired and hungry, so he headed home. Turn 
on, heads home. On the way, he stopped to make a few friends. Looking at the pet store. He stopped again to make a few more friends. Hot dog stand, an outdoor restaurant. And a few more. Suddenly, Amos realized it was getting late. I'd better hurry, he thought. But what Amos hadn't thought about, and what dog does think about such things, was rush hour traffic. Uh-oh. That was bumper to bumper to couch to bumper. Poor Amos. He would never get back before the Bobsons unless they were stuck in traffic too. But they weren't. Oh, where on earth could he be? Amos! Amos! He hadn't touched his food. His toys were, they, were where they had always been, under the couch. But where was the couch? The Bobsons began to fear they might never see Amos again. But rush hour doesn't last forever. Whoosh! Amos! Amos needn't have worried. The Bobsons were just happy to see him. So that's your secret, they said. From then on, Amos was the happiest dog in the world because the Bobsons took him everywhere they went. There they go. And every once in a while, Amos took them someplace too. Whoosh! Vroom! A ride on the couch. That is a silly story. Amos, the story of an old dog and his couch. Susan Seligson and Howard, Howard Schneider. <clears throat> That's not that terribly old. 1987. This next one is a great imagination story. And it's set in a different part of the country. It's set in Arizona. So the pictures of the plants and the animals look different. But imagine as we're reading it, that you your place that you might have here in Vermont. This is called Rocks a Boxin by Alice McLaren, illustrated by Barbara Cooney. And it's actually based on a real story. I'll tell you about it after we read. See, very different. High desert. Rocks a Boxin. Miriam called it Rocks a Boxin. She always knew the name of everything. There across the road, it looked like any rocky hill, nothing but sand and rocks, some old wooden boxes, cactus and greasewood and thorny ocotillo. But it was a special place. The street between Rocks a Boxin and the house is curved like a river, so... Marion named it the River Road. And after that, you had to ford a river to reach Rocks of Oxen. What is Rocks of Oxen? Of course, all of Marion's sisters came. Anna Mae and Francis and little Jean. Charles from next door, even though he was 12. Oh, and Eleanor, naturally, and Jamie with his brother, Paul. Later on, there were others, but these were the first. Well, not really the first. Roxa Boxen had always been there and must have belonged to others long before. There they are. The neighborhood. When Marion dug up a tin box filled with round black pebbles, everyone knew what it was. It was buried treasure. 
Those pebbles were the money of Roxaboxen. You could still find others like them if you looked hard enough. So some days became treasure hunting days with everybody trying to find that special kind. And then on other days, you might just find one without even looking. A town in Roxaboxen began to grow, traced in lines of stone. Main Street first, edged with the whitest ones, and then the houses. Charles made his of the biggest stones. After all, he was the oldest. At first, the houses were very plain, but soon they all began to add more rooms. The old wooden boxes could be shelves or tables or anything you wanted. You could find pieces of pottery for dishes. Round pieces were best. There's Roxa Box and the main street. Everyone builds their houses with the rocks. Later on, there was a town hall. Marion was mayor, of course. That was just the way she was. Nobody minded. After a while, they added other streets. Frances moved to one of them and built herself a new house outlined in desert glass, bits of amber, amethyst, and sea green, a house of jewels. And because everybody had plenty of bunny, remember the pebbles? There were plenty of shops. Jean helped Marianne in the bakery, pretend pies and cakes and bread baked warm in the sun. And there were two ice cream parlors. Was Paul's ice cream the best or Eleanor's? Everybody kept trying them both. In Roxa Boxen, you could eat all the ice cream you wanted. Everybody had a car. All you needed was something round for a steering wheel. Of course, if you broke the speed limit, you had to go to jail. The jail had cactus on the floor to make it uncomfortable. So, and Jamie was the policeman. Anna May, quiet little Anna May was always speeding. You think she'd like going to jail. See all of them driving with their steering wheels? running, driving. But oh, if you had a horse, you could go as fast as the wind. There were no speed limits for horses and you didn't have to stay on the roads. All you needed for a horse was a stick and some kind of bridle and you could gallop anywhere. Sometimes there were wars. Once there was a great war, boys against girls. Charles and Marion were the generals. The girls had Fort Irene, and they were all girl scouts. The boys made a fort at the other end of Roxaboxen, and they were all bandits. Oh, the raids were fierce, loud with whooping and the stamping of horses. The whirling swords of Ocotillo had sharp thorns, but when you reached your fort, you were safe. Boys' fort and the girls' fort. Rocks Boxen had a cemetery in case anyone died, but the only grave in it was for a dead lizard. Each year when the cactus bloomed, they decorated the grave with flowers. There's the liver lizard and there's the cemetery. Sometimes in the winter, when everybody was at school and the weather was bad, no one went to Roxaboxen at all, not for weeks and weeks. But it didn't matter. Roxaboxen was always waiting. Roxaboxen was always there. And spring came and the Ocotillo bl blossomed and everybody sucked the honey from its flowers. And then everybody built new rooms and everybody decided to have jeweled windows. That summer, there were three new houses on the East Slope and two new shops on Main Street. And so it went. The seasons changed and the years went by. Roxaboxen was always there. 
The years went by and the seasons changed until at last all the friends had grown tall. and One by one they moved away to other towns, to other houses. So you might think that was the end of Roxaboxin. But oh no, because none of them ever forgot Roxaboxin. Not one of them ever forgot. Years later, Marion's children listened to stories of that place and fell asleep dreaming dreams of Roxaboxin. Gray-haired Charles picked up a black pebble on the beach and stood holding it, remembering Roxaboxin. More than 50 years later, Frances went back and Roxaboxin was still there. She could see the white stones bordering Main Street. And there, where she had built her house, the desert glass still glowed, amethyst, amber, and sea green. The end. So the uh, note in the back of the story says that um, on a hill on the southeast corner on 2nd Avenue and 8th Street in Yuma, Arizona, there is a place once known as Roxaboxin. The events in this book really happened to Alice McLaren's mother. So the author's mother, and by listening to her mom's stories and reading lots of letters, she was able to write a story about Roxaboxin. Really fun, I love that story. Uh, let's read. Another classic, Swimmy, by Leo Leone, a very brave fish, a brave fish story. This one was written in 1963, I think. Let's check and see. Yep, 1963, by Leo Leone. He wrote it and he did the pictures, and the artwork in this book is something to really pay attention to. It's beautiful. I'm trying to figure out, did he draw it? Did he paint it? Swimmy by Leo Leone. A happy school of little fish lived in the corner of the sea somewhere, and they were all red. Only one of them was as black as a mussel shell. He swam faster than all his brothers and sisters. His name was Swimmy. There he is. One bad day, a tuna fish, swift, fierce, and very hungry, came darting through the waves. In one gulp, he swallowed all the little red fish. Only Swimmy escaped. He swam away in the deep, wet world. He was scared, lonely, and very sad. Tiny fish in a big world, all alone. But the sea was full of wonderful creatures, and as he swam from marvel to marvel, Swimmy slowly became happy again. He saw a Medusa made of rainbow jelly. A lobster who walked about like a water-moving machine. Strange fish pulled by an invisible thread. Oh, a forest of seaweeds growing from sugar candy rock. An eel whose tail was almost too far away to remember. And sea anemones who looked like pink palm trees swaying in the wind. Then Hidden in the dark shade of rocks and weeds, he sh saw a school of fish just like his own. Let's go swim and play and see things, he said happily. 
We can't, said the little red fish. The big fish will eat us all. But you can't just lie there, said Swimmy. We must think of something. Swimmy thought and thought and thought. And then, oh, I have it, he said. We are going to swim all together like the biggest fish in the sea. Hmm. He taught them to swim close together, each in his own place. And when they had learned to swim like one giant fish, he said, I'll be the eye. It looks like a big fish. And so they swam in the cool morning water and the midday sun and chased the big fish away. The end. Leo Leone, Swimmy. Good story. Also beautiful artwork. The texture of these pages is something. I don't know if you can see it up close. It's almost like makes you want to touch it. All right, we're gonna have one more story here. And this is a very old story. It is not a library book. Good thing, because it's a mess. It is a book from my library that I've had for a very long time. It was written originally in, goodness, how old is this book? From the Viking Press, 1936. That is an old story. It's written by Monroe Leaf with drawings by Robert Lawson. And somebody long ago did some coloring in this book. We're going to try and ignore that. See, like on this first page, there's some coloring that's not supposed to be there. Once upon a time in Spain, the title of this book is The Story of Ferdinand. Once upon a time in Spain, there was a little bull and his name was Ferdinand. All the other little bulls he lived with would run and jump and butt their heads together. But not Ferdinand. He just liked to sit quietly and smell the flowers. He had a favorite spot out in the pasture under a cork tree. It was his favorite tree and he would sit in its shade all day ah, and smell the flowers. Sometimes his mother, who was a cow, would worry about him. She was afraid that he would be lonesome all by himself. Why don't you run and play with the other little bulls and skip and butt your head, she would say. But Ferdinand would shake his head. I like it better here, where I can just sit quietly and ah, smell the flowers. His mother saw that he was not lonesome, and because she was an understanding mother, even though she was a cow, she just let him sit there and be happy. As the years went by, Ferdinand grew and grew and grew until he was big and strong. Two years. So it says, yeah, two years old. All the other bulls who had grown up with him in the same pasture would fight each other. All day they would butt each other and stick each other with their horns. What they wanted most of all was to be picked to fight at the bullfights in Madrid. There's a sign. It says, bullfight at the stadium, Madrid. It's like being famous. But not Ferdinand. He just liked to sit quietly and smell the flowers.
One day, five men came in very funny hats to pick the biggest, fastest, roughest bull to fight in the bullfights in Madrid. There they are, and yes, their hats are very funny. All the other bulls ran around snorting and budding, leaping and jumping, so the men would think that they were the very, very, very strongest and fiercest bulls and pick them. But not Ferdinand. Ferdinand knew that they wouldn't pick him, and he didn't care. So he went out to his favorite cork tree to sit down. He didn't look where he was sitting, and instead of sitting on the nice cool grass in the shade, he sat on a bumblebee. Well, if you were a bumblebee and a bull sat on you, what would you do? You would sting him, and that is just what the bee did to Ferdinand. Uh-oh, that is a face. Ooh. Wow, did it hurt. Ferdinand jumped up with a snort. He ran around puffing and snorting, budding and pawing the ground as if he were crazy. The five men with the funny hats saw him and they all shouted with joy. Here was the largest and fiercest bull of all, just the one for the bullfights in Madrid. So they took him away for the bullfight day in a cart. What a day it was, what a celebration. Flags were flying, bands were playing. And all of the lovely ladies had flowers in their hair in the stadium. They had a parade into the bull ring. First came the banderilleros with long, sharp pins with ribbons on them to stick in the bull and make him mad. Then came the picadores who rode skinny horses and they had long spears to stick in the bull and make him even madder. Then came the matador, the proudest of all. He thought he was very handsome and bowed to the ladies. He had a red cape and a sword and was supposed to stick the bull last of all. And then came the bull. And you know who that was, don't you? Ferdinand. doesn't look very fierce, does he? They called him Ferdinand the Fierce, and all the banderilleros were afraid of him, and the picadores were afraid of him, and the matador was scared stiff. Ferdinand ran to the middle of the ring, and everyone shouted and clapped because they thought he was going to fight fiercely and butt and snort and stick his horns around. but not Ferdinand. When he got to the middle of the ring, he saw the flowers in all the lovely ladies' hair, and he just sat down quietly and smelled. He wouldn't fight and be fierce no matter what they did. He just sat and smelled. And the banderilleros were mad, and the picadores were madder, and the matador was so mad he cried because he couldn't show off with his cape and sword. So they had to take Ferdinand home in a cart. And for all I know, he is still sitting there under his favorite cork tree, 
smelling the flowers just quietly. He is very happy. The end. The Story of Ferdinand by Monroe Leaf, 1936. That's a pretty good story. That is all for us today. I'm so glad you joined us for Big Kids Story Time. I will see you again early next week. Watch our channel for more posts. See you next time. Bye.